beats in the heart of every true fan. Rugby was prospering in every sense of the word. In 1910, a rugby ground was built on the outskirts of London, at Twickenham. This became the famous headquarters of English rugby, and eventually the towering structure that we know today. The first game at Twickenham featured Harlequins and Richmond. Quins won 14-10. Their team included two great players, Adrian Stoop and Ronald William Poulton Palmer. The first international at Twickenham was England-Wales. England won 11-6, the first English victory since 1898. This team too included the influential Stoop and Poulton Palmer. Poulton Palmer was one of the many casualties of the Great War. You see, when the war broke out, the rugby union decreed and they sent a letter out to all clubs that everybody was to join the army and that rugby was to cease. And so, as a result, flocks of, of uh, players joined up and the amount of, of uh, people lost was extreme. A typical example is in the last match played in 1914 between England and Scotland, 12 players died, six uh, Scots and six English. So there was a whole load who never came back, amongst them Poulton Palmer, of course. Uh, Poulton Palmer was the star three-quarter of England in those days, and he was killed in 1915, leading a, a, a raid. The interwar years, however, were an era of rugby prosperity, especially in England. In the 20s, more clubs were formed than in any other decade. As education became accessible, open to all, the middle classes formed old boys clubs. Rugby became the fashionable game for the educated middle class. More players played the game than ever before. This was reflected in the success of the national team, who went on to win four Grand Slams in the 20s, including victory 10-6 against France in 1921, the first of their 1920s Grand Slams. And this win, 12-3 in Dublin against Ireland in 1922, in a year when, unusual in that decade, Wales beat England and took the championship. And victory in Swansea, against the Welsh in 1924, another Grand Slam year for the English. Today's players like Neil Back would have had a field day in the 20s when England players like Captain Wavell Wakefield ruled the roost in the new system. Wakefield completely revolutionised back row play. He worked out that if the back row swung the scrum round to whichever side he wanted, then the back row would be in front of the three quarters. And provided they had the ball, they could then move forward. And this is what they did. And there was nothing to stop them. All they had was two or three three quarters who happened to be on that side, able to try and tackle them. And with the numbers they had, it was a piece of cake. And they won two grand slams that way. And it wasn't till later that they tightened the laws up to preclude uh, the scrum moving more than 90 degrees, which it is now, and further, that uh, the back row had to hold on to the other players. They were quite free to break any time they wished. In Scotland, in rugby terms at least, they mirrored the English trends. They too had fine teams in the 20s and 30s. They lost to England in 1925, but took the championship. In 1927, they shared the championship with Ireland, despite losing here in Dublin. In Wales, where the game was based far more amongst the working class than in England, the game suffered during the Depression years. The national team hardly won a game in this period, and English superiority reigned. But even in the 1920s, the Southern Hemisphere were leading the way. In 1924-25, the All Blacks toured Britain with devastating effect. 
they took revenge for their 1905 defeat by beating Wales 19-0. They were too good for a strong English side too, challenging them with the traditional hacker before beating them 17-11, despite being reduced to 14 players. The match was apparently a violent one. Cyril Brownlee, the All Black, became the first player to be sent off at Twickenham, supposedly for punching an opponent. The All Blacks finished the tour undefeated. But the Southern Hemisphere sides were not only creating stronger players, they were pioneering new formats and rule changes. The Springboks of that era developed the 3-4-1 setup in the scrum, the forebear of today's packs, although at the time the Kiwis made do with two in the front row. When New Zealand went to South Africa for the 1928 series, they packed 2-3-2, an obvious disadvantage. If, if, if you're packing like that, a uh, two-three-two, you, you never got the loose head. And uh, this chap, when the ball's put in, this fellow's nearer to the side to the putting it in. But he's also got it that side of the scrum, which meant they, meant they had the loose head uh, whichever side the ball was put in. Well, what New Zealand did then was uh, say, right, uh, Ron Stewart, one of the big forwards in the, in the New Zealand team, he went loose head and he, what he did, he waited to see which side the ball was being put in and he, he ran from behind here to, to whichever side the ball was being put in. So that, the, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, wherever, wherever he went, he made the loose head for for South Africa, for New Zealand. He, he, if he went that side, he was nearer the ball than this chap, and if he went the other side, he was nearer the ball than the loose head the other side, which is pretty. New Zealand then drew that series two-two against uh, South Africa. The spring box against the All Blacks was always the heavyweight contest and always controversial. For that 1928 series, two great Maori players, George Napier and Jimmy Milne, were left behind. Napier had been one of the stars of the phenomenal touring team of 1924, but rather than rock the boat, he was omitted from the party. In France during the 1920s, rugby prospered. But despite the growing strength of the game, it took until 1927 for them to defeat England, and even longer to defeat Wales. Shamaterism prospered. Players were helped out by their clubs, with expenses, food at restaurants, the best jobs. At club level, the Federation responded by banning some of their leading players. The British rugby authorities, however, unconvinced by this stance, broke off relations with France in 1931. The 30s was not a good era for the England team, for a number of reasons. Of course, the selection was ad hoc. You decided yourself we had big selection committees, who, as you're well aware, committees don't always agree. A player was selected. If he had a bad game, he was dropped. And someone else took his place. If he had a bad game, he was dropped. And perhaps the first one would come back again. And that's how it went on. And they just uh, played as individual. No coaching nobody to tell them what to do, no game plan. In South Africa, two dominant figures emerged. Firstly, August Marcotta, who selected the 1931 touring team to Great Britain. It's 19 years since the last rugger team came over from South Africa, so we're glad to see them, and may they have great sport on their tour. Sitting on the left there is Tyndall, the full back. Next to him is J.C. van der Westhuizen, vice-captain, then Benny Osler, the skipper, he seems rather shy. And the two this team fellows, included a 21-year-old scrum half called Darny Craven, a man who was later to dictate the direction of South African rugby. De Villiers and Craven, scrum halves, Van Merwe forward, and Venter wing three-quarter who weighs 13 stone eight. Heavy for a three, but he's fast with it. The 1931 Springboks beat all the four home nations, and convincingly.
In the mid-1930s, Wales's fortunes revived, due in no small part to the emergence of grammar schools dedicated to rugby football, and thus a new generation of talent, especially in the backs. They also didn't have the British selection problems. Part of the reason for this was the fact that the Welsh, being a smaller nation, got together. They played in teams where they, everybody knew each other. There weren't the number of teams to pick from, you see. There was only, what, 140 odd Welsh teams altogether. There was over five or six hundred teams in England in the 30s. In 1933, the Welsh team won at Twickenham for the first time. From their first game there in 1910, they suffered a string of eight defeats and one draw in 1931. This 7-3 victory in 1933 put an end to that bogey. In 1935, the All Blacks returned. The All Blacks are here again. British rugger teams, beware, they're after your blood. The famous New Zealand rugby team are in training at Newton Abbott, and our camera catches them showing exactly how forward movement should be done, while their manager, Mr. V.R. Meredith, looks on. On the right, the captain, J. Manchester, we wish him and his team the best of luck. On a frosty winter afternoon at Cardiff Arms Park, a crowd of 50,000 is waiting to see whether Wales, for so many years a power in British rugger, can make any impression on this year's only once beaten All Blacks. 30 years ago, this ground saw Wales beat that season's touring New Zealanders. So at any rate, the home team, have history behind them, and at the interval it's New Zealand three points, Wales naught. But it's the second half that is sensational, that puts every man jack in the crowd right up on his toes. Told by the score, the story is that Wales score a try, convert and are two points up. Within five minutes they score and convert again, seven points up. Fighting like demons, New Zealand's Gilbert drops a goal, Wales only three points up, New Zealand score and convert again. Now they lead by two points. Then Rhys Jones of Wales is over again, and a 30-year-old Welsh victory is repeated by 13 points to 12. After losing to Wales, the All Blacks went to Twickenham. At Twickenham, for 70,000 rugger fans, it's the high spot of the season, when England come out for their first international match against the All Blacks. England is playing in white, and standing in the middle is Obolensky destined to play such a great part in this match. Many at first thought the All Blacks unbeatable, but their recent whacking by Wales have given England new hope. And that was a one-off. No one quite knows how. Um, they played above themselves. Everybody played well on the day, and the following match, they, they didn't play at all well, but they played very well on that day, plus the fact that the Prince Oblensky was an unusual player. Prior to the in international, he played for Oxford University against New Zealand and had run round their fullback and scored a try. When they came to Twickenham, he did precisely the same thing. The result, of course, was that New Zealanders were on the watch for him. The second time he had the ball, everybody moved to the right. But England do put the up a merely for turned the left hour, and went into the left hand corner, struggle, almost on the post. In midfield. And then Obolensky steps right into the picture with a magnificent demonstration. From a scrum, the ball goes out to the three quarters. Obolensky takes it from Gerard, going like a racehorse. He sweeps round and touches down 10 yards from the post. Dunkley takes the kick, but it hits the crossbar. England three up. Within a few minutes, Obolensky does it again. This time he gets the ball from Cranmer and cuts right across to the left corner flag, putting England six up. And the match ends magnificently by England winning by 13 points to naught. I thought I wanted to see what these tries were because I'd be up against it and playing against it the following Saturday. So I went uh, to a news flick place in the Strand. I paid a shilling, sat down, and they Two tries came, boom, boom, like that quickly, three minutes. I thought I must see those again. I stayed in another hour. I said, oh, all these awful cartoons, I had to wait for them to go through and to see it again. And I stayed there for four hours, I say, to see this thing four times.
Throughout this era, New Zealand and South Africa were now accepted as the two best teams in the game. The 1933 series in New Zealand between the two rivals was seen as the championship of the world. In the event, South Africa triumphed two games to one to establish their dominance. In 1938, the Lions team had to go to South Africa to take on these giants. They had just come back and been hailed as the finest team ever to leave New Zealand was the 1937 Springboks, they yeah. all said, you see. But Donny Clavin was the vice captain in, in uh, New Zealand, he's captain against us. So we had to play them uh, uh, immediately afterwards. They, they, they came back from New Zealand in 37, and we had to play them in 1938. So they were a very hot side. The Lions lost the first two tests, but triumphed in the third and final game of the series. It was a magnificent second half rally by Torres. Recovery after interview were 13 three, three down at half time. And you know, we thought we were going to get that. For the second half, we scored 18 points to their three. And a marvelous uh, second half from our point of view. Uh, and uh, we were a very popular team, touring team. We, well, this time they knew all our players. They, the crowd rushed on and they carried our Sammy Walker captain off the field, you know, they shoulder high and all that sort of thing. During the 40s, sport understandably took second place to the World War. Five Nations games were suspended from 1939 to 1947. But on their resumption in 1947, the championship was shared by England and Wales. Welsh rugby 15 in dark shorts, gain a 3 nothing surprise victory over France. Watch Wales stop another effort by the Frenchman. Moving from back to centre, Newport's Ken Jones, letter B, gets away with the ball. Hitherto unbeaten, France may not now head the international championship table after all. The Wales-Ireland clash and the England-France match will decide who's to be the premier rugby team. The four countries have an even chance. Cardiff Farms Park, the white-shorted Wallabies kick off before a 40,000 crowd in the last match of their tour. With the Barbarians as opponents, the Australians are unable to lay the Cardiff bogey. From ex-printer Cyril Holmes, number 11, comes the home side's first try, Edinburgh's steel bodger touching down. Since 1948, touring sides to the British Isles have always ended their tour with the game against the Barbarians. In 1948, the Barbars instigated the tradition of including one uncapped player for their game against the Wallabies at the Cardiff Arms Park. The Wallabies equalise with a Tonkin penalty, which hits the post and bounces over. But the home side is unbeatable. The third try comes from a turn of pass to Hayden Tanner, and the Australians go down by 9 to 6. Murray Field, South Africa, in dark jerseys, kicked off against Scotland in the 13th match of their tour, which was bad luck for Scotland. The Scots attacked early on and for 17 minutes held their own. In fact, they nearly scored first. 1951-52 saw the visit of another Titanic Springboks team to the British Isles. This was a Scottish side that hadn't won the championship since 1938, but the result was still an embarrassment. A defensive slip gave Muller a chance, and he scored. A converted try by Latigan made it 39-0. Then Dinkelman fought through the score on the post, and with Geffen's aid, made the final score 44-0. England kick off at Twickenham, where the Springboks suffered their only defeat of the tour against London counties, and right from the start it's evident that it's going to be a hard game. Oxy tackles Woodward. He's playing a ripping game. And Woodward showing plenty of form. Yeah, plenty. He'll need a new pair of bags. There'll be a slight interval for him to adjust his dress. The Springboks lead 5-3 at halftime. England are doing much better than expected. And in the second half, the Springboks are still in danger. A 
penalty settle the issue. Muller takes the kick. The ball goes in off to give South Africa victory by eight points to three and a clean sweep in the international. These were a good few years for the Welsh team. In 1950, they won the championship, seen here beating England 11-5 at Twickenham. In 1952, they won the Grand Slam. And in 1954, both Cardiff and the national team defeated the All Blacks. Cardiff in striped shirts kick off against the sofa unbeaten All Blacks at Cardiff Arms Park. Spurred on by the roar of 56,000 of their countrymen, the Welshmen are soon giving the New Zealanders something to think about by keeping up a solid attack. Thomas gets it to teammate Rowlands. Rowlands' cross kick goes under the goal and starts a wild scramble. The Cardiff forwards join in the fray, and finally the ball reaches the hands of Sid Judd, who bundles over for the first touchdown. The All Blacks kick off against Wales at Cardiff Arms Park, straight into a dazzling sun that won't help them much in this rugby classic. Now for some of the stuff that 56,000 people have come to see. Brisk, bustling attacking by the New Zealanders and stubborn do-or-die defence by the Welshmen. Thomas punts it across the field where Ken Jones is ready and waiting. Jones has it safe and sound and over he goes. A perfect touchdown that gives Wales a solid lead in the last few minutes of the match. Rowlands takes the conversion, two more points for Wales. There's no further score, so Wales have done it by 13 points to eight. This was, however, an all-black side that was good enough to beat England, Ireland, Scotland and the Barbarians. Now New Zealand and Davis passes to Guy Bowers and away goes the 20-year-old all-black racing for the Irish line. A perfectly timed pass finds Richard White. Bob Stewart receives and over he goes to touchdown. Ten minutes after half-time, a penalty gives the All Blacks a chance of scoring. Bob Scott takes it. New Zealand three points in the lead, are full of confidence now. But towards the end of the second half, there's another anxious moment for Scotland as the All Blacks dive for the corner, with Haig leading the rush. But he touches down just short of the line, and New Zealand, with a narrow win by three points to nil, adds Scotland to their list of victories. So far, there's not a lot to choose between the teams. They're both playing hard and fast. Along the Barbarians line to Griffiths, who, like Quicksilver, darts through the All Blacks defenders for a perfect touchdown right between the posts. The conversion is no problem for King. Sixteen five to the All Blacks. No conversion for that one. Only two minutes left and Dixon passes to McCaw. As McCaw goes down, he slips it to White, who dives over for yet another. With the final score at 19 points to five, the All Blacks, one of the finest and most popular teams ever to visit this country, end their triumphant tour. In 1955, the Lions visited South Africa under the leadership first of Irish lock Robin Thompson and latterly Cliff Morgan. The series was squared, but the highlight of the tour was the historic first test at Johannesburg. Deep passes to Morgan. With a line underway, Davis gives the ball to Butterfield. Butterfield rips the defence wide open before giving out a pet loo, goes over in the corner for an unconverted try. <laughs> Springbok captain Stephen Five passes to Breers, goes over in the corner for a converted try, and South Africa leads 11-3. <laughs> Only two minutes left before half-time, Butterfield has it. He dummies and puts in a brilliant run to score between the posts a magnificent try. Morgan knifing his way through the fence for a try. Cameron converted, and the Lions had regained the lead by 13 points to 11. <laughs> there was more to come when Morgan sent a kick upfield. Jackman escaped, misjudged it, and O'Reilly following up, gathered and went for the line. O'Reilly, however, was brought down a matter of inches short, but his teammate Greenwood kicked forward and scored. This was converted, and another goal gave the Lions a lead of 23-11. The Springboks were back within striking distance, and here comes the strike. Elliot is grasped, but Sinclair backs him up. Sinclair has it, and from the scramble, the ball comes out to Breers on the wing, and Breers goes over to make the score 23-22. What a last-minute situation. A 
And a terrific strain from the skate takes the deciding kick. It goes astray, and the British Isles have won the first test by 23 points to 22. The 50s were a good era for the English, too. Championship victories in 1953 and 1954 were followed by the Grand Slam in 1957. Scotland in dark shirts kick off against England in the last rugby international of the season. And it's a determined side they're fighting, for an English victory will make a clean sweep of the Calcutta Cup, the International Championship and the Triple Crown. Not long to go now, and the powerful English scrum are really on top of the game. Right in front of the post, they heel to scrum half Jeeps, who's pulled down. A quick scramble, but standoff Bartlett is there, and he gets it away to Higgins. And it's over the line for the final try, clinching England's three-in-one victory. What a finish to the season. The English team followed this by taking the championship in 1958. If Wales and England were strong in the 50s, so too were the French. In 1954, they shared the five nations for the first time, and in 1958, they became the first team this century to win a test series in South Africa. In 1959, they finally won the Five Nations Championship outright for the first time, despite losing to Ireland in Dublin. This match of the season against the champions, France. President O'Kelly greeted the teams and the big crowd were keyed up to expect a great match. Playing left to right in this picture, Ireland kicked off. The right centre, M.K. Flynn, bamboozled the French defence, passed to Brophy. The left wing head towards the line and scored a try, unconverted. For the next 20 minutes, Ireland was subjected to heavy pressure. Jean Dupuis went clean through the Irish defence and touched down in an excellent position. Full-back Pierre Lacaz added the goal point. Neither team scored again. At no side, Ireland had beaten the champions and earned the congratulations of the rugby world. In 1959, another important Lions tour to New Zealand to taste defeat in the series 3-1. Now the crowd sees some of the play that's made O'Reilly's reputation. With terrific speed, the Irish wing three-quarter makes a bid for the New Zealand goal line, but just can't get there. O'Reilly has the ball. He's streaking away. He throws a one-hander to Scotland. They'll never stop now. Jackson has it. He beats McPhail. He beats Urban. Colton won't stop him, and he's scored in the corner. Niverson try that brings the score to three all, and the time is running out in the first half. Slow motion now shows Risman at his best. Mulligan sends him the ball. He moves round on the blind side, dodging Meads. He's racing up the line now, and they can't stop him. He sidesteps McPhail. Pickering can't catch him. Don Clark will be too late, and Risman has scored by the magnificent The first test, a win to New Zealand by 1817, rekindled all the arguments about the value of a try compared to the value of a penalty. The Lions scored three superb tries, but lost to six kicks by the awesome Don Clark. In 1961, another tour for the Springboks. 70,000 cheered and England, all in white, began their most formidable task of the season. Could they hold the so far unconquerable South Africans? Wales and Ireland both failed, but only by small margins. There was little in it for most of the first half until Springbok's wing forward, Doug Hopwood, took a pass from Clarsen, raced ahead and went over for the only try of the match. Benny from sale. The Barbars were awarded a Springbok head after becoming the first side in the British Isles to defeat them. Penny from sale. And there's Ace in trouble and Morris picked it up and he scores! The Springboks were devastating. They went on to beat the British Isles 3-0 on the Lions Tour of 1962. One of the 1962 Lions was Richard Sharp, on his day an outstanding back. Typical of his approach was this contender for try of the century against Scotland in 1963. The Welsh sides were going from strength to strength. They won the Triple Crown in 1965 and the Championship in 1966. Scotland kick off against Wales before a capacity crowd at Murrayfield. After kicking a penalty goal, Wales attack again, and S.J. Watkins scores a try. A brilliant fullback T.G. Price adds the goal points. So Wales lead 8-6 at half-time. 
Time's running out, and Wales put all they've got into a do-or-die attack. A line-out. The Flanethley forward, in our Gale, crashes over the line. So Wales win 14-12. If they can beat Ireland, they'll win the Triple Crown for the first time in 13 years. And the championship in 1966. England are playing left to right in this scene.